fabulous and I love it. <laughs> and we're recording. Opening up the floodgates as if there's 200 yeah. people. Oh, hi, everyone. Everyone that's out there watching, we want to welcome you to the Pivot with a Purpose panel. Say that five times fast. We are so thrilled that you are here with us this evening. So whether you are here with us live or you are watching the recording, um, we're just so happy that you're here and we know that you're going to get a lot out of this evening's event. So I would like to um, personally welcome you as your host. My name is Debbie Neely. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you in person, um, so I will be your host for this evening. I own Neely Coaching and Training. So I have a heart for helping people discover their, their best selves and get results through leadership coaching and training. Um, Based on my job, you probably can surmise that I like learning. I'm a big continuous learner. I love to learn new things. I love to increase awareness. I love to help other people do that. And I have to tell you, one of my favorite ways to learn is by listening to people's stories. Storytelling is such a powerful tool. And when you hear people's stories, where they've been, you know, the journey that they've been through, the lessons that they've learned, the advice that they have, their takeaways from that, and you can dig through that and find those little nuggets of wisdom that help you achieve your results. To me, that's pure gold. And I have a feeling that that is going to happen for you a lot tonight. You're going to get all kinds of little nuggets of wisdom that you can use. So I want to congratulate all of you, our audience, for being here, for taking the time to invest in yourself. I have a feeling you don't do that very often. Um, you probably have a lot of other people that are priorities. And so I really wanna congratulate you for making yourself a prior priority this evening. So make sure that you are setting yourself up for success, right? Put that phone on silent, um, minimize the distractions, really make sure that you can focus and enjoy this experience. So we are going to start off by getting to know you all a little bit by doing a poll question. So I love poll questions because um, they're fun and they're anonymous. So you can choose as many answers as you want and we don't know who, who picked what. So that's kind of the, the fun of it all. So your poll question tonight is gonna be what motivated you to join us for this session? Maybe you're thinking about a pivot. Maybe you're in the midst of your own pivot. You might just be seeking some practical takeaways to implement in your life personally and or professionally. Maybe you're like me and you're a continuous learner. You just want to soak it all in or you're seeking inspiration. I know a lot of people this past year are like, I'm seeking inspiration. I need a new adventure. I need to get out of my house, right? Or you know what? I just love being around powerful women. So go ahead and select which one of those answers you feel like is your, your motivation for joining us the, this evening. And then we're gonna see how this all plays out as a group. So I feel like this is really exciting. It's almost like a game show, you guys, right? And we're, <laughs> and we're waiting for the results to, to show up. So let's see what our group has to say from the poll. So we, we've got a mixed bag here, which I love, because that means you're all gonna get some different things from tonight. Um, so yeah, we have 23% thinking about a pivot, 15% is in the midst of a pivot. That's phenomenal, I love that. 31% seeking some takeaways, 46% are continuous learners, love it. 15% looking for that new adventure. And here, here's the big winner, you guys. 54% just loves being around powerful women. So we are going to definitely deliver on that for you all this evening. So whatever brought you here tonight, we're just happy that you're here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before last spring, I bet the word pivot was not a word that you heard a lot, right? Unless your favorite episode was the Friends episode where they're trying to move <laughs> the sofa and Ross keeps yelling pivot, right? Then, then you may have heard it a lot. Um, but my guess is it probably wasn't like your number one vocabulary word. Um, it definitely has become part of our vocabulary during the pandemic. So this past year, women particularly have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is a lot of essential workers are women. The other reason is women were really impacted by all the shifts that were happening, right? All these crazy um, quick changes that were happening, you know, in your work life, your family life, your home life, like everything was shifting. And women were trying to 
keep up with that and balance everything and make sure everyone was taken care of. And so it really hit women hard, the, the pandemic. But the cool thing that we've seen over and over again is that women have this unique resilience to deal with those types of things. And that's what we saw. We saw women step up and be resilient during the pandemic. A really cool um, fact that demonstrates that is if you look at the countries all around the world, the countries that were led by women fared much better than other countries. So I think that is a really cool statistic. I think that's a, I think that's a girl power statistic right there. So let me share a couple other statistics with you. According to a September 2020 survey from the Professional Women's Network Albright, women are emerging from these unprecedented times with a career shift on their minds. One in four are setting their own business up moving forward. And over 60% are planning a complete pivot altogether. So you're about to hear the stories of three women who were ahead of that curve. Right? They did their pivots before the pandemic. And they're also going to share some personal pivots that led to their success as well. Now, I had the privilege to chat with each of our panelists one on one and to hear their stories and ask questions in preparation for this evening. Um, and I have to tell you, the last couple of weeks, I've been amazed at how many times I've thought back on those conversations. Like, it really stuck with me. Like, I've been amazed how I've been talking to someone and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I have advice from someone who's been through that and, and sharing that. So I just want you all to know already we've been paying it forward and I'm the only one that's heard your story so far. So I think that is like, it's like super cool. And I'm really excited for you all to hear their stories as well. So I'm a little bit of a fangirl, Brene Brown. I, I really love her books. I love her quotes. And one quote kept coming into my head when I thought of our, our three lovely panel members here. And I wanna read that quote to you. It goes like this, when I see people stand fully in their truth, when I see someone fall down, get back up and say, you know, that really hurt, but this is important to me. So I'm going in again. My gut reaction to that is what a badass. And so that's what I think about these three women on the panelists. You know, they've, they've been there, they've done it, and they're here to share it with you. And to share your story, to give someone a glimpse into your life, really takes some vulnerability and courage. So um, I have a lot of respect for these women on the panel, and I'm really excited for you to hear from them. Real quick, another reason why I'm excited about this event tonight is I believe that any time that we have the opportunity to let people tell their stories, to really let them be seen and heard, we are all much stronger for that. So before we go too deep into the content, I need to do some host duties. Okay, so I have a couple of housekeeping um, items to share with you all. First of all, you're probably used to this virtual world by now. I know we don't really like it 100%, but we're getting used to it. And one way that we can be interactive is by using the chat feature. So if you wanna show our panel, our panelists here some love, feel free to put some comments for them in the, in the chat where they can read those. You can chat with each other. Um, so the chat feature is there for you to use. I also wanna give a big shout out to our production crew. Yes, we have a production crew. It is a crew of two. <laughs> and it is the fabulous Jennifer Gerlach, VP of Communications and Marketing for the Chamber, and the awesome Caitlin Walsh, Member Services Coordinator for the Chamber. And they are doing their thing like they always do. They are behind the scenes, making sure everything runs smooth for us. And they are also going to be monitoring the chat box. So if you run into any kind of technical difficulty or you have a question, you can reach out to them directly there. I also want to let you know that if you have a question for the panel yourself, so I have lots of questions, but I'm free to get some time up to you guys. Um, so if you have a question that pops up for you, um, just something you're curious about, something you want to know, write it down and there's going to be an opportunity for you to pop that into the Q&A feature. And um, we're going to share those with our, our panelists and, and see what they have to say about your questions. Um, and keep in mind, this is being recorded, so there will be people who will view this later. You will also get a link to this recording, um, and I would encourage you to watch it again. I have a very strong feeling that as many times as you watch this, you'll take new things away each time. So keep a, an eye out for the link to the recording as well. 
All right, so I've been talking a lot, which anyone who knows me knows that's really not me. <laughs> so we're going to get into really introducing our, our panelists here and getting to know them better. Um, there's no way for me to tell you everything about them because that would take all night, right? There's, there's lots of that. This is things about these three women. So I've just taken, taken a snapshot to give you um, just a, an overview of who they are and a little bit about their background. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you the funny, smart, and courageous Andy Overton. Hi, Andy. <laughs> so Andy's previous career was in law enforcement. She is currently the Director of Business Development at Mount St. Mary's University's Frederick Campus. She works to bring industry and academia together, helping others reach their professional goals through academia, workforce development, and mentorship. A dedicated public speaker, Andy has devoted her professional career to serving the underserved while fighting for equality and equity. Andy is a mentor, a community volunteer, and a local activist. I think everyone, does everyone know Andy pretty much, right? <laughs> a 2019 Emerge Maryland graduate, Andy has two graduate degrees and is working toward her doctorate with Frostburg State University. Her research centers on adult learning assessment and virtual reality. How cool is that? We need to talk, Andy. That sounds super cool. She lives with her fiance and several rescue animals in Hagerstown, Maryland. So, wow, I, I can't wait to call you Dr. Overton. <laughs> so welcome to the panel. So service-oriented, bold, hardworking. These are all words that I would use to describe Another one of our panelists, Elizabeth DeRose. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> so when I met one-on-one -on -one to talk with Elizabeth, I said, hey, I'm here to hear your story about your pivot. And she laughed and said, which pivot would that be? So Elizabeth has had several pivots throughout her years. So um, as I share her bio, I want you to count them. So count, see if you can count her pivots. And um, Elizabeth, we'll, we'll have you keep us Keep us straight and see if we, if we can get the number right on how many pivots you've had, okay? <laughs> All right, so Elizabeth is a graduate of the University of Illinois. She holds a BS in finance and had a successful first career in the financial sector working in Chicago. Eventually, her love of cooking called to change careers and she attended the Culinary Institute of America where she earned a culinary arts degree and more importantly, met her future husband and the love of her life, Ralph. She returned to Chicago to work for lettuce. So I've been practicing that all day, like the vegetable. Lettuce, entertain you enterprises. I think that's such a cool name. As a chef, and then she became director of operations there. Before moving back to Frederick in 2001, at which time she joined the national restaurant consulting firm, v, is it VSAG? So we make sure I get that right, VSAG, as vice president for a number of years. Then she began a new career in the nonprofit sector, serving as the director of operations for an organization that provides services to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. She then joined Frederick Community College in 2016 to direct the Hospitality, Culinary, and Tourism Institute. She's an active member of the Rotary Club of Carroll Creek, which I think we might have some people out there from, um, the Women's Giving Circle. She serves on the Leadership Council for Community Fairs, Farm to Circle Program, and in her spare time, which I don't know how she has any, she volunteers throughout the community. So I do think you get the, the title of Queen of Pivots, Elizabeth. So how many pivots do, did you guys count? I would say, anyone have a guess? I would say maybe six or seven. What, do you, what, 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 what was the number, Elizabeth? I think it was five. Five? <laughs> I think seven was in my head because just about every seven years you were making every a seven pivot, years. right? <laughs> so seven's kind of your number, I thought. But um, we really appreciate you being here. Thanks for being here, Elizabeth. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the resourceful, intelligent, and resilient Catrice Scott. Hi, Catrice. So Catrice is a self-taught cookie decorator who runs Too Sweet LLC, 
an online bakery here in Frederick, Maryland, operating out of Maryland Bakes, a commercial kitchen co-op. She was born and raised in downtown Frederick, Maryland. <laughs> and she vividly remembers um, the elaborate birthday parties her family would throw for her and her twin sister every year. Unexpected circumstances led Catrice into this new bakery career. And um, just a little teaser, you're gonna hear a lot more about that very shortly. <laughs> And she said, soon cookies consumed her life. Fast forward three years during a global pandemic and she can be found curating full dessert tables featuring items from her custom sugar cookies to cupcakes to chocolate dipped treats. Her talents go beyond baking as she is sure to include artistry in every order. She's ready to help make your next event too sweet. I love that. And Catrice, your bio completely made me hungry. I have to say <laughs> that when I read it, I kept reading it. I'm like, oh my gosh, now I want a cupcake. Um, so thank you. Thanks for being here this evening, Catrice. So let's give a virtual round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you guys for being here. So you've learned a little bit about them. Um, and so now I'm excited for you to hear from them. Um, I've asked them each to share a personal story that I believe will tell you a little bit more about them and also give you a glimpse into the power of a pivot. So Andy, we're gonna start with you. So Andy, you had a pivotal moment in your former career of, light, of law enforcement when you realized that you were not happy. Can you tell us about that time and how you made the decision to do something about it? Oh my goodness. First off, hello everyone. I'm so happy everyone's here. Thanks for coming. Um, hello to my panelists as well, my colleagues, and thanks Debbie so much. Um, thanks Caitlin and, and the Frederick Chamber for having me. So yeah, so I was in law enforcement, right, which is an awesome job, don't get me wrong, and it's not anything that I would um, ever discourage anyone from going to, but I was working like 24-7. I would work in the evening time, I'd go to court in the daytime, and I looked in the mirror and I was no longer 25 years old. I looked like I was well beyond that, right? And I was just tired and I was angry and I couldn't fix the world. Um, and I had to sit down um, with some friends actually of mine and they're like, basically, you know, what, what are you doing? Are you happy? Do you like what you do? And I'm like, I love what I do, but I don't love how it's making me feel, right? And I literally sat down and did, did like a decision matrix. I put down the good, the bad, what makes me happy in life in general and figured out that those two things didn't collide. Um, and so I just had to figure out how I could use the skills that I knew that I had in a way that not only helped my community and I could be an activist and I can work and I can volunteer, but also that didn't exhaust me every day. Um, and I had to make that decision about where that intersection was. And I figured out that the career that I was in uh, I had taken a hard left from my happiness. And so I had to get back into where that, that intersection actually was an intersection and not far off in the distance. And I had to line up those needs, goals, and values and what made me happy in my career um, and figure out what that career was. So it was that point that I thought, this is not working out for me and I've got to make some decisions fast. So I did. Good for you, Andy. I, I love, I think a lot of us have the awareness that something needs to change, but then we got to get to the desire for it to change, right? And so I love how you did that. The decision matrix makes me laugh, you know, but we, we all do that, right? And I feel like this last year, a lot of people have said that what's important to them and their core values have become more and more clear to them. Sure. And I think, and that sounds like that's what happened to you and you weren't in alignment. So you made a big change. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And I used a decision matrix because that's what I do, but I think anybody could find whatever that is to put that information in perspective and go from there. It doesn't have to be a decision matrix. It just has to be right for you. Yeah, I love a decision matrix. Give me that, give me a visual, I love it. Yep. <laughs> so thank you, Andy, thanks for sharing that. So Elizabeth, a big moment for you that I wanted you to share um, that you had told me about was when you were graduating from the Culinary Institute of America and you were interviewing for your next job and someone asked you, why should we hire you? Tell us about that moment. Yeah, that is something I'm never gonna forget because I decided to do a career change from finance to you know, becoming a chef when I was you know, in my 30s and when I completed the program, everybody around me who was graduating, you know, they were young kids, you know, um, who'd worked in the industry for, for a number of years. 
And so the premier company I knew I wanted to work for back in Chicago came to interview and they said, why should I hire you? Just like, just like you said, Debbie. And I said, and they said, you know, everybody else has so much experience in the industry. You have no experience in our actual industry, um, which was true because I came from a different industry. And I said, this is why you should hire me. I might not have those technical skills that everybody else has. I said, but I can learn those. And I'm a pretty quick study. I said, but what I have that all the rest of them don't have is I have experience, I have maturity, I have critical thinking skills, problem solving, I can supervise people, I can work as a team, play nice in the sandbox. Um, I said, so it's that, it's that what they refer to as the 51%, you know, what's more important than the technical skills, the 49%. And he hired me on the spot for my dream job. So yeah, I just kind of turned it around. So I was very, I'm very grateful for that opportunity. I love that because you said that was the only company that you were interviewing for, right? So you were taking that leap of faith and you did the reframe, right? Reframing it from, oh my gosh, am I the oldest person at the school to guess what? That's my competitive advantage, right? And reframing that in your head to take that chance. I love that. And we all can do reframes, right? You just have to train yourself to do it. Exactly. Great. So Catrice, for your personal story, um, I kept thinking, you know, sometimes we're nudged into action, right? We just get that little nudge or we feel that little tug when you do something. And sometimes we hit a wall hard when it comes to making a change. And you had actually shared with me when we chatted that you felt like God had turned a negative into a positive for you. Will you tell us your story about where you were right before the pivot what that caused the pivot and how that got you to where you are today. Well, hello, everybody. So my pivot actually occurred <clears throat> during a negative time in my life. Um, I was pivoting from a career at State Farm as a claims processor. And I did decide that I wanted to go into the hospitality industry, but I didn't know exactly what it is that I wanted to do. Um, so in the midst of me trying to figure that out, I was involved in a tragic incident um, where my ankle was broke. Um, someone that was close to me broke my ankle. And unexpectedly, of course, um, I went through depression. I ended up having to move into my sister's basement. I almost lost my car twice. Um, I just was going through a really, really, really bad time. Not being able to work, you know, going to therapy, being on crutches. Um, so my pivot occurred <laughs> during just the most negative time of my life. Um, my sister ended up asking me to do some cookies for a client that she had. Uh, I have a twin sister who was a baker and she was pregnant and asked me to do the cookies. And of course I said no, because I had no prior experience. But after I got done my first set, I was like, oh, I actually kind of like this. And once I posted to social media, I've never stopped. It's been about four years now. That is so awesome. And you told me, tell us the first cookies, it was how many and, and what was the, the theme of the cookies? Yes, yeah, so I had a hundred henna print cookies to do, okay? And I just want to let everybody know that I got that order done while on crutches. <laughs> Thanks, Catrice. Catrice was saying her, she, she, she's got her comeback story, right? And part of it was her sister recently got married and she said, I went from crutches to walk in heels, heels at my sister's heels. wedding. <laughs> Oh, y'all don't know how good that felt. I wore heels. I mean, and you know, didn't, well, I ended up taking them off, but I wore them. We took pictures. We did, I just, oh yeah, one wonderful feeling. <laughs> That's so funny because I'm like, yeah, most people are probably like, I want to take those heels off. <laughs> so yeah, I love that. I love that comeback story. And your comeback story is not over yet, so. Yes. <laughs> so I'm sure by now you guys can figure out why we've selected these three women to be on the panel. They're showing us exactly what it looks like to have grit. Um, so I love it. So we've got lots more for you all. So you've probably heard 
right? The stats around who you surround yourself with and how important that is, how those people have an influence on your life, on your behaviors and your attitude and your language and just pretty much everything. Um, and I would say a common theme that I heard from all three of these fabulous women was how they talked about how other people influence them positively and profoundly to get them to their successes and to where they are today. So Elizabeth, I know one of your pivots was due, unfortunately, to the company that you were working for at the time, downsizing and eliminating your position. Um, and you had shared that this was the start of a hard time for you. What role did relationships and connections play in moving forward for you? Thank you for asking that question, um, Debbie. And you know, just to comment, the the previous pivots I had made in my life were were self imposed. I decided to make those, right? I decided to do a career change or move to another city. But this particular instance that you're talking about was, um, you know, not of my choice. I was let go from my job, um, and um, within you know a very short amount of time, um, you know, diagnosed with with breast cancer. And so I was unemployed. I didn't have medical benefits, you know, um, and it was, a, it was a really dark time. And, you know, your question is, what role did relationships play? And I was so blessed to truly, you know, within that period of time, um, you know, got more involved with our community. Um, I, I joined our local Rotary Club. Um, you know, I, I, our local women's giving circle and tapped into the friendships um, that I had had over the years for support. And they really carried me through. Um, I, I couldn't have gotten to my next stage, my next step without the support and the encouragement um, and the, imagine the possibility, right, of, of what's ahead of you without that. Um, and so, you know, one of the, one of the common themes that I that I talk about, you know, when you and I spoke, and when I talk to other people, is your circle is just so important in your life that you keep increasing and diversifying your circle of support. Um, you know, to have people that are older than you and younger than you and different um, stations in your life because. Um, it serves you well. You 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 can have something to give to them. They have something to give to you. And in that period of time, um, that that circle of support really helped get me to the next stage um, of my career and the next stage of my personal life. So um, relationships and and people and who you know um, really critical and, and couldn't say enough about the importance of that. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I love the message of diversifying right, your circle. I think that is so important um, to learn from people who are different than you, right, get, get those different perspectives. Elizabeth, will you tell us a little bit about um, part of the story that you had told me was you, you were able to meet somebody who actually led to you being able to, to get an opportunity to interview for the job that you're in now. You just kind of boldly went up and talked to this person. Will you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, you know, when you're, when you're kind of in that space of, okay, what do I have to lose? Um, you know, uh, I'm not in a great space mentally anyway, uh, you know, because I, I, you know, imagine that um, there's a lot of obstacles in front of me. I was at a meeting and it was with a, a women's giving circle luncheon and I had seen the position posted for the position that I'm currently in, which is to you know manage the Culinary and Hospitality Institute at Frederick Community College. And one of the members of the Women's Giving Circle was Libby Burmaster, and she was um, uh, president of FCC. And um, I saw her and I said, I am just gonna go up and introduce myself and tell her I'm interviewing for this job. What do I care? I have anything to lose. Um, so as, as the luncheon was ending, you know, I kind of made my way to her and I just went up to her and I said, hi, my name's Elizabeth DeRose. I'm interviewing for this position that you have right now. And I hope you'll strongly consider me for that role because I think I'm perfectly suited for it. I didn't care. I was bold. I didn't care what was going to happen. What was the downside of me saying that to her? And she looked at me and she said, thank you for, 
thank you for letting me know that. Please stay in touch with me. And, you know, fast forward a few weeks later, and she was on my interview panel, and I, and I got, you know, was, was fortunate enough to, to land the job. But I just I put myself out there, um, you know, thinking, what do I have to lose? I, I don't care. And, and, and it served me well. So take a chance. Doesn't hurt. Love it. Take a chance. Put yourself out there. Let them know, right? Let them know. Pick me. I want it. I love that. That's why I'm so glad that you're willing to share that because I think I think there's a great lesson there. One of the quotes that you shared with me that I thought was really interesting because you were talking about your past and how all the different pieces have come together to where you are now. And you said, there is a plan, right? You don't know it at the time, <laughs> but there's a plan and there's a reason for the detours and it all comes together. I thought that was a, a great quote that you had shared with me. So Catrice. So for you, when we talk about influence and the people around you, family has played um, a pivotal role for you in your support system throughout the years. But in addition to your traditional family, you, you talked to me about some neighbors that you had that had a big influence on you. Um, will you talk to us about the people around you and how they made a difference for you? Yeah, so actually growing up, I had four sets of grandparents. I had four grandmothers, very strong, independent women very inspiring women, uh, very future forward uh, women, even uh, like my aunts, my mother, sister, my father has six sisters. Um, everybody touched me and my sister in a lot of different ways, um, throwing parties for us uh, for every occasion um, and not normal parties, like extravagant parties, things that we, it really stuck with us over the years. And um, I really think that is the reason why we do what we do now. Um, my sister's also, I guess in this industry, she, she does parties and things, but she's really a, a pharmacy tech, but she just does everything. Um, so the people that helped us um, were older women, women. I thought it was funny, you said to me, we did cool cookies and cakes before it was cool. <laughs> right like now it's kind of the cool thing there's all these shows right yeah she was doing barbie figure cakes number cake <laughs> like way before it was cool yeah so tell us a little bit about mr and mrs lee yes um so uh we have mr william o lee jr and miss cynthia lee who lived next door and they actually were our adopted grandparents they didn't have any grandkids of their own so they just took us in um, we like to do like dress up and she would host tea parties for us and just teach us really how to be women, how to be independent um, and just how to carry yourself when you're around others. I love that. And when you talk about them, like you light up, you know, so that that says a lot. That doesn't have to be your traditional family that has such an influence on on you. Right. It can it can exactly. be other people. Exactly. Um, and so I would put the challenge out to our audience tonight to think about that, right? Who are you investing in right now? And how can you make a difference for somebody? Maybe it's the, the two little girls next door, right? So, so think about that. And you had said to me when you thought about the, all the independent and strong women in your life, if they could do it, I felt like I could do it too. Yes. If they could do it, I could do it. Love it. Love it. That should be your mantra, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you can use that. You can copyright it. I'll give that to you. <laughs> All right. So Andy, when we're talking about influential people around us, you had a very persistent friend who encouraged your pivot. So how did that friend, as well as just your inner circle in general, help you in, in taking that leap? Yeah. So, so remember the last time, the last time I told, you know, um, did my story a few minutes ago, I said I was like miserable, right? And of course that comes out in different ways. So I'm sitting around with a bunch of friends for the most part and I'm like, oh, this I'm just tired all the time and I'm not really making change and what am I doing? And my, my friend was like, you know, there's this position at a college and you should apply. And I'm like, no, like, I don't think you know what, do you know what I do? I feel like I'm superwoman all the time. Like, I'm not gonna go work at a college. And I poo pooed the idea. And she was like, okay. And then the position came open again and she's like, you know, you should really, really apply <laughs> to this job. And what she, she was really telling me, and we had a long conversation about this is you are miserable and I'm giving you an out. 
What are you doing? Why are you staying in the same place that day in and day out that you are, it's just killing you. Like, what do you do? I'm, I'm giving you on a silver platter. You've told me no now, you know, again. And you know what I said? I said, no, because that's <laughs> ludicrous. Right. And it wasn't until she came around again and literally sat me down and said, I don't think you're hearing me. I'm not saying that you're going to get the job, but you need to apply for it. You need to work this out. You need to take the step because, you know, I, I want to see you in a couple years, not in a hospital bed because you've had a heart attack someplace. Take the leap. Just apply to the position. Like, what do you have to lose? Right, Elizabeth? What do you have to lose? And finally, on the third time, I went, ah, okay, I'll apply to the job. Um, and it literally that that was the pivot so all this stuff that led up to it all of my friends saying andy you know we love you you're doing great work but let's make this happen this stuff doesn't happen on a dime this was weeks if not months of this one friend going look i'm only going to offer it to you three times you you got to take some of this at some point you have to make that decision you have to be able to pivot and do something else. And it's not forever. Just apply to the position and see what happens. And luckily, I came to my senses. I applied. I got the position. And wow, I'm in education now. Um, and, and that was really that point. But that buildup happened for months. And later on down the road, my friend and I will sit around and laugh over wines and beers. And she's like, I could not have been more clear. And you were blind. Like, what was wrong with you? And I said, I was scared, right? I didn't want it. This is my happy place. This is my routine. This is what I do every day. And I would thank her um, almost on every anniversary of my employment with this college and say, thanks for asking me three times to apply to this job. She's like, yeah, that's great because it wasn't going to come up again. So that was kind of the end of it for you. Anyway, so that support system and my friends and my family, like they went with it, but they're kind of like, listen, girl, you got to make some changes or we're all going to be miserable with you. And no one wants to live that way. Apply to the darn job. And I did. It's kind of the nudges that I was talking about with Patrice, right? You nudge, 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 and sometimes hit you over the head, right? It was nudge, nudge. And then, you know, that part in, um, what is the movie? Um, this is Sparta when he kicks the guy into the pit. That's kind of the third ask, right? She was like, look, I can't do this any more clearly, you know, apply to the, Apply to the damn position, Andy, and I went okay. <laughs> that was the kick into the pit for me. I love that. And so I would encourage everyone out there when you're thinking of your inner circles, look at who's in your inner circle. It's kind of like the diversity that Elizabeth was talking about. You know, part of that is you want the people who are give you good advice and are encouraging and all that. But you also want the people who are going to give you the kick in the butt when you need it and who are going to challenge you and tell you the truth when you need to hear the truth too, right? So make sure you have all of that in your inner circle. I have a friend who, when I talk about things for too long, she'll say, okay, that's great. We need to stop talking about it and do it, right? She's my, just do it, friend. Like, stop talking about it. So we all need, we all need that in our inner circle. So take a look at your inner circle. That's, that's my tip to all of you today. Is there anything else anybody would like to add when it comes to the people around you and, and how influential that can be? Yeah, Andy. I wanted to like raise my hand like in class, you know, I've been in higher ed for too long. So, so listen, here's, here's my, my three sentences, right, is be that person too. Remember, like it's, it's, it's not always about you. That's really hard as, as an only child in a Capricorn. It's always about me, but I have to remember it's not always about me. Be that person that you had at some point or need now. Be that person, uh, whether it's the Sparta kick, whether it's the Libby Burmaster, whether it's Mr. and Mrs. Lee, uh, be that person to someone in your circle. Um, and I think that is, is the most rewarding thing that we can do. Keep the cycle going. Absolutely. That's great, Andy. And I would say, I would add to that to just, you know, keep pushing to diversify your circle, right? And, and um, have people that are, that can give you wisdom because they've traveled your path before. So that are, that are older than you and have people who are younger that you can impart wisdom to that can keep you current. Right. And, um, you know, people within your station and out of your station, it's really important um, to just have a very diverse network and, um, you know, not be afraid to meet new people and make new friendships and look for every opportunity to do that. And, and 
you know, one of, I, I tell, I tell my students, um, at the school that I make a sport of volunteering at various events throughout the community because I, um, part of it is I love to give back. Sure, I do. But I also like to get in free to a whole bunch of events. So, <laughs> you know, hey, um, all these events that you get to volunteer for, you get to be part of them and be around these amazing people and not pay to get in them. Um, but also you're elbow to elbow with people who share the same spirit that you do they share the same you know um i'm i'm it's a saturday it's my day off and this is how i choose to spend my time i'm going to just help out and volunteer and that's a great way to spend your time off so um and you never know who you're going to meet right that um might know someone it's, it's the whole seven degrees of i don't even i'm not going to say it right of kevin bacon separation whatever whatever that whatever pivot you think is future in you know in your life you never know who you're going to meet that might help you in that next change that's forthcoming that you have no idea what's what's around the corner. And this is a perfect example. You three are my three new best friends. <laughs> yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Go, Valor. All right, so we have some people in the audience when you took our poll. You guys remember they said that they're thinking about a pivot. They're in the midst of a pivot. Right, they're looking for a new adventure. Um, so we know that people are out there and they're looking for resources and advice and things that maybe work for you that, that maybe can help them to work for them as well. So um, Andy, going from law enforcement to education, I have a feeling there were some things you had to learn, but probably some things you had to unlearn as well. So you were really able to go into that learning mode, right? So tell us how learning mode and, and leveraging your growth mindset really helped you with your pivot. Yeah. So, you know, going from pulling over bad guys or helping, you know, people in accidents to talking about college education to parents and kids was like a left hand turn down a dirt road and you have no idea where it's going. And I realized like on day, I don't know, hour two maybe that I was no longer the smartest person in the room. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and that I, if I didn't slow down and stop and learn and absorb information, I was, I was not gonna be successful at this job because the things that I did before, while they were applicable at like a 10,000 foot level, how many people, how to understand, how to understand where folks are coming from. I had no idea how to process an application and how to make sure that you didn't sign up for graphic design when you're really a culinary student. Like I had no clue. And yes, they trained me, but, but you know, we don't want graphic designers cooking our soup and we don't want people in our soup kitchens, obviously trying to make flyers. Like it just doesn't work. And so I knew very quickly that um, I needed I needed to stop and get rid of the bad habits by always understanding. I mean, after five years of being a cop, like I knew stuff, I knew how to do everything. I knew how to re write reports and speak to my sergeant. And I knew where my beat was. And I knew how to drive a car and operate the lights. And now all of a sudden, it's like I couldn't figure out how to log on to email. It was like, it was like that. It was a culture shift. So what I had to really do, like I said, is slow down, stop, and just take it in. And without understanding that I am no longer the person that other people would go to for information because I'm the new kid on the block, it was time for me to learn. It was learning on the job. It was asking questions. And I figured out, and this is kind of a cop thing, I could ask for help and no one would make fun of me. Like, it was great. I'd walk up to someone and say, hi, I'd like some help on how to do this task. And they'd say, great, I'll show you. And I'm like, what? what? This is awesome. Um, and so if I hadn't asked for that help, I would flounder. And I think that's really the key point, right? Is that when we do make that pivot, when we do get into something new, it's okay to not know everything. And it's okay to observe that, that information and try and um, teach yourself whatever skill that you want to become either an expert or really good at. And that's fine. That's what we're expected to do on day one or hour two in my job. And before you knew it, I was getting far more comfortable with what I was doing and I was having fun and I was making new friends and it was great. And I didn't have to work on Christmas and no one on the daily was trying to kill me. And I thought that alone was a super positive thing that I could finally let my guard down and just learn. And I think that relates to almost any pivot. It's okay not to be the smartest person. It's okay to not know everything, but you gotta ask for a little bit of help and then you get to learn and improve. And I think that just really kind of worked out. That's awesome. I have to tell you, so I work with leaders going through transitions, you know, maybe they're new to leadership or they're transitioning yeah. to leadership levels. 
whatever the transition is. And that, that is probably the number one thing that they will tell me they don't, they don't want to ask for help. They just don't, they see it as a weakness. They see it, uh, you know, whatever. And they just don't want to do it and getting them over that, that it, it's okay. Like it's, it's okay to ask for help. We all need help, right? That's right. I love that. And I love the, ref, you know, reflection piece of being able to stop and say, how am I doing? What's working? What's not working? And making adjustments as, as you go along. I think those are really important in that learning mode, that growth mindset mode. Yeah, I agree. All right, so Catrice, a lot of people are going to be surprised to know that when you started the bakery, went into the bakery business, that you didn't know how to decorate cookies and in how to, you know, bake. You, you really had to learn your skill set yes. and you had to learn how to be a businesswoman, right? So double, double learning that. going on there. <laughs> so, but you also shared some really great resources with me that you were able to tap into and use that helped you be successful. Will you share um, both the resources you used to learn your skill, but also the resources that you found that helped you in the business world? Yes. So with my skill, um, really Instagram videos and YouTube became my very best friend. And I am a firm believer that whatever you want to learn in life, you can learn on YouTube. Okay. If you don't know how to do something, you can simply YouTube it. Like no joke. <laughs> Anything. Um, and when it came to the business, uh, my resources that I did use, I actually stopped down City Hall first. Um, which pointed me in multiple directions. They had unlimited amounts of resources and people to point me to. And they pointed me to the Roots Building. I ended up in the Roots Building. Um, SBA had a department there. They had a minority business group there. There was an abundance of resources. If you want something, you just go out and you have to find it. Back to that asking, right? Ask, ask for what you need and someone will point you in the right direction. You actually mentioned a specific- More than you could have ever dreamed, you know? Yeah. So you actually mentioned a specific person to me. Do you want to give that person a shout out? Um, who did I say? A gentleman. Oh, Brand Brandon Mason? Yes, Brandon Mason was a huge help to me. Um, I Actually, it, since COVID, I'm not sure if his office is still here in Frederick. I haven't been able to get a hold of him. Um, <laughs> but um, he was with the small business administration and I mean he knew everything he knew <laughs> everything about business well good for you I love the YouTube thing I think it's so funny that you're like I learned my whole skill set from YouTube I just pulled up a YouTube video <laughs> and learned it. oh you know I did want to give another shout out to Terry Rowe um, she was actually a good resource as well. She is the owner of the commercial kitchen that I rent my space out of. So she was, or, and is still a huge resource. And also women who pivoted. She went from the healthcare field um, and now she owns her own commercial kitchen that she rents out. So kind of what Elizabeth was talking about, right? Find, find someone who's already been a little further down the road than you and, and learn from them. Yes. That's great. Well, thank you. You just gave a lot of resources. I'm sure people are going to be look, probably Googling it right now, right? All the resources that you just mentioned. So Elizabeth, in addition to practical resources, like the ones Catrice just shared and the learning mindset, like Andy talked about, um, really getting your mindset right, right, for, the, for these pivots is an important part. Can you tell us um, what are some things that you learned from all your pivots that help with mindset? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of it is, uh, a lot of it for me was dispelling the fear and the anxiety that was associated with whatever pivot I was trying to make. And um, to dispel that, I would arm myself with information. So I, I, I couldn't stress enough the power of and, and the value of having information at your disposal to familiarize yourself, to get more comfortable with whatever possibility is that you're imagining for yourself. When you, you think it's, oh, there's no way I can attain that. Well, just start to inform yourself about what that industry, what that job, what that new place you want to live looks like, what that, whatever it is, right? And um, 
the more information you have, the more comfortable you become with understanding what's involved with it. So arming yourself with information was really helpful to me um, to start to become a little bit more comfortable with, okay, I think I, I know what's involved and, you know, I can um, pursue it with a level of, you know, uh, knowledge and I can be articulate and articulate and talking about it. Um, and, and, and people, um, you know, really uh, understanding the value of relationships and not being afraid to make new relationships at any turn because you just don't know where they're going to lead. And, uh, um, you know, they, they say that you, you manage, you know, throughout your life, you manage three things. You manage information, you manage people, and you manage action. And um, so information, arm yourself with valuable information. Um, people constantly diversify your network and your circle of support and, and, and arm yourself with great people who have just been through all different kinds of um, circles in their life that you just don't know how it, will, how it will help you going forward. And action, you gotta take action, okay? You can't do those other two things without taking some action in your life, right? So it's, it's information, people, and action. You gotta do something each time, each day, each week um, towards uh, realizing that next goal. So, you know, but, but for me in terms of um, how could I make that next pivot, the, the biggest thing was, um, you know, arming myself with information and um, surrounding myself with people that I would talk to and get a little bit more comfortable and dispel my anxiety and, and fear around what that next change might be. Yeah, fear definitely can be a roadblock for sure. Um, I love too that I know you talked about some of the ways that you were just able to clear your mind, right? But I think you, I think you like yoga and um, you gratitude, practicing gratitude. Um, and I think that looks different for everybody. I think, I think it's really important that you don't try to force yourself into some mold of what you think it's supposed to look like. Like for me, I, I cannot meditate if, if my life depended on, I, I just cannot do it. <laughs> right. So that's just not my thing, but there are other things, right? Journaling. I love to journal. So you got to find your thing that just helps you keep your mind clear um, and kind of keep calm and keep yourself open to the possibilities. Yeah, I call it, you know, filling your well. You have to keep your well full and you have to have balance in your life. So, you know, if I would spend, you know, I, I would start to get really like depressed and just my energy well was empty if I was like, you know, constantly applying for jobs online. That is the most depressing thing ever is to apply for jobs online, right? Um, and it just sucks your, sucks your energy well. So I would be like, okay, you know what? I have to balance my day, balance my week with things that fill my well with positive energy and surround myself and do things that make me happy and, you know, be around people that, that bring me joy and do things, be around my family, whatever that was that brought me joy um, to balance out the agony and the anxiety of like the other part that like I, I call it the eating the eating the lima beans on the plate right <laughs> you gotta eat the lima beans um, but what are you gonna do you know you always gotta eat the lima beans but you gotta get balance in, in, in your plate and in, in your life so yeah every once in a while you need a cupcake right Catrice <laughs> so what fills your well Andy and Catrice what are the things that fill the the well like Elizabeth was talking about the things that fill her well what are the things for you Mine is actually family. Spending time with my family is the most rewarding thing for me. So, so for me, sometimes my sponge gets filled. I just can't take in any more information, which means I can't make a decision. So while I'm also someone who has a hard time meditating, I have to go someplace and do something that allows me to process all that information. Uh, so I'm real good at compartmentalizing until it spills over into other compartments and then I can't think anymore. Like literally my brain's like, stop, <laughs> you've got to <laughs> deal with this or we can't do anything else. So either that's a softball game, it's a walk, it's going to work out. It was back in the day, I used to play a boatload of video games because I could dump my information and like play baseball online for four hours. I don't quite play video games anymore, but it's that, I have to do something that allows me to um, release the sponge so I can make a decision about what's next. I think we all get there. Well, I'm like, when I can't think anymore, it's like my, my, my body tells me, right? Like my brain just kind of shuts down and I'm like, I gotta, I gotta do something about that. So you all make the pivot look easy, even though we know it's not. 
We know, yeah, we know there's a lot that goes into it, but you really do make it look easy. Um, but for you, what was the moment that told you it was all worth it? All of the, the stuff that you went through and the learning and being uncomfortable and all of that. I want you each to share because you each have really great moments of when you were like, this is why I did this. This was told me that it was worth it. So Catrice, we're going to start with you. What was the moment that told you that the pivot was worth it? So my moment was when I stood in the studios for Food Network's Christmas Cookie Challenge Woo! in the midst of the pandemic, <laughs> I might add, um, that, and, and got to meet Ree and Eddie Jackson and just the whole experience of being on TV and allowing people to see my talent. Um, that was definitely my aha moment. <laughs> And you were picked out of how many people? Well, I was picked out of uh, 34,000 contestants, guys. Yes. And I had to go through a few rounds, um, you know, before the show even happened. So I was very blessed to be one of the people that were actually picked. We love that you got to represent your, oh, yeah. your skills. And that definitely was a moment that was worth it for sure. All right, Elizabeth, tell us about your moment when you knew it was worth it. Uh, so when I had um, taken the job that I'm in now, um, the program had a lot of opportunity um, to restore itself um, in terms of its reputation in the community and, and quality of what it was doing, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I had to rebuild the team. Uh, I had to uh, restore the reputation of the program within the community. I had to rebuild a lot of relationships. Um, and it was important to me to uh, build a scholarship fund specifically for students who wanted to pursue culinary and hospitality, um, you know, because it's, it's, it's a tough industry. And, um, uh, you know, 95% of students in my program you know, need financial aid. So when I came into the program in 2016, there, you know, I was, it was an uphill battle. And, um, you know, we did a lot of things really quickly, built our team, did some fundraising events and wine dinners and, and ran our restaurant. And, and it was just, it was go, go, go from the minute I started. And um, I, didn't, I didn't know if it would yield results. I didn't know if the direction I was going in was right. I just felt like, you know what, we got, we got to do a lot of different things on a lot of different fronts and let's just hope it pays off. Let's just like throw in the, just much spaghetti at the wall and see, and see what sticks. And, um, you know, nine months later when we had our convocation at the college, um, you know, the, the president awarded us with um, an, uh, an award um, and it was an innovation award. Um, for all of the innovative things we had done in the past year to rebuild the program. And that was just really heartwarming to me. It wasn't an award for myself, it was for our team. But that, that's when I said, you know what, it was worth it. This was the right decision to go into education. This, this was the, great, the best job for me. So yeah, that, that's what I knew. Awesome, great job. And for innovation, I love that. All right, Andy, so you're up. What was, what's the moment for you that tells you it's all worth it? Yeah, so I flip careers, like total pivot. And I, there were times that I'm like, what am I doing, right? This is ridiculous, what am I doing? And after about, I, I came in at a certain time and then about uh, 10 months later, I attended the first graduation since my own, right? And all the students, not all, but some of the students that had come in and transferred, some of the students I'd gotten to know in advising were walking across the stage and they were happy and their parents were hugging them. And I was like, okay, now I get it, right? So again, the, the reason that it was the moment for me is because I realized I can still help people, right? And that's why you get into law enforcement. So the only difference is that I'm doing it in education. These folks are receiving their degrees. They worked hard. I helped advise them. Their parents are like high-fiving them. They're like, I'm going to go to Disney World. And <laughs> I, I feel good that there was, I was a very small part of that. They did the work, but I felt so proud of my students. And I thought, well, I think I'm here for life. That's pretty awesome. And that's what solidified it for me. I love that. Watching them cross the stage and knowing that you played a part in that, right? For sure. Yeah, of course you did. Yeah, I love that. 
you guys, those are such great moments. I, I, I was like, we have to get these moments in because you each had one. And I'm like, okay, yeah, there, there it is, right? That's there it is. There's your acknowledgement that you're on the right path and you're doing great things. Um, so I could go in all night asking you all questions, but I do want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions as well. So if you have been thinking about some questions that you'd like me to ask the panelists, um, maybe something you're just curious about, something that's popped into your head, um, please don't use the chat feature because um, it might be hard for us to find the question. So we're going to ask you to use the Q&A feature and you can just pop your question in there. And I can go right in there and pull them out and ask the panelists. So it can be anything that you've thought of, anything that just popped into your head. I know if you're like me, I'm always like, oh my gosh, like I wanna know more about that. Or I wanna know why they did it that way or you know, what advice they would have in these different situations. And um, they're not prepped for that this, but they are ready to go for whatever questions that you guys <laughs> might have for them. Um, so just pop them in there and we will ask to so super, let's see. All right, are you guys ready for this one? Um, and again, just let me know if you wanna answer it. So the question is, what do you think stops people from taking that big leap? Fear. We all have it. But How did you overcome it, Catrice? Um, well, I had to. So, you know, it's nice, like, listening, um, you know, to Andy's story. I love Andy's story because she was, she was just, she was willing to, to take that step. And she knew the steps that she needed to take in order to change her career. Um, I think that I took a long time with my fear, holding on to my fear and not wanting to move forward. And it was like, God just smacked me and I fell to the ground literally that's how I felt I, I was on the ground so I didn't have a choice you know I, I think that people should take their chance when they're able to instead of when you have to yeah I I, I think that um Oh, I don't, I mean, there's <laughs> fear. Yes, without a doubt. It's also the uncertainty and the unknown. It's none of that. We're always scared to be able to pivot and go a different direction, but routine is safe, right? Because you know it and you can do it every day. It's like driving to your job. You could probably do it blindfolded. Don't do that. But I'm just saying you probably could. And so getting out of that routine is scary, but here's what I'll say. We cannot grow if we are comfortable. And I really believe that to the very core of my being, whether it's learning something new, meeting someone new, walking up to Libby Burmeister and saying, yo, you need to hire me, right? So I think that we have to be uncomfortable to grow, period, no matter where we are. And I think that staying in comfort keeps us from pivoting in a, whether it's small or huge, it keeps us where we are. It's okay to be uncomfortable, embrace it and run with it and, and go, go ask for the job interview from the president of a college. That is so boss, Elizabeth, oh my Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Piggybacking on you said, Andy, you know, it's also not being afraid to tap into, you know, the, the people, but also women in your circle that you look up to and you're like, wow, you look up and you're like, wow, they, they're so successful. I really admire them for blah, 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 blah. And not being afraid to say, to ask them for help because no, who says no? Like, nobody says no when you ask them to help you. No one says no when you say, hey, you know what? I, I, I'd love to pick your brain about blah, blah, blah. Whoever says, nobody says no. Right. So, you know, it's a, just like ask for help ask for advice, ask people, how did you get to where you're at? Like, what do you advice you have? No one's ever gonna say no to you because I don't know, people just don't. Like in general, we wanna help each other. So, you know, you have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. I love that. And so another Brene Brown, you know, she says a lot of times that you choose courage over comfort, right? You can't, you can't be courageous and be comfortable. Those two things is don't don't go together. So pick your courage over your comfort. So to add on to this a little bit, especially for women, I hear a lot, you know, we hear the term imposter syndrome, where a lot of women will say, you know, I just have this voice inside my head that says, I can't, I'm not enough. I can't do this. I'm never going to be successful. How, how do you quiet that voice? Do you guys have any tips for that? Cool. 
That's a hard mm-hmm. one. I go through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would just say I um, I try to make sure that there's more positive than negative in my thought process or within my day, right? So I start it with gratitude. And, and you know, I'd say this is, the, you know, as corny as it might sound, but this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is what I'm grateful for. The start of my day is this is what I'm grateful for. And, you know, more positive thoughts and negative thoughts. And they'll always win out. I don't know. Positivity always wins out over negativity. Yeah. So, so I live by this 80 20 rule, right? So, uh, for instance, in my law enforcement job, I, I'm supposed to be 80% happy and 20% like, ah, this is the hard stuff I don't really want to do. And for me, it was flipped, right? So when the imposter syndrome comes in, I have to think, is that a 20% thought or an 80% thought? Is there something I should really pay attention to because I'm, in, I'm, I'm really in fear of doing something because it's not good for me? Am I in fear of doing something or I shouldn't be here because truly this is the wrong place for me? Or am I just freaking out? Because if I'm just freaking out, that's the 20%. And that means I've got to pay attention to the 80%, which means get your job done, go do what you are born to do, whatever that is, go ask for help, go make it happen. And that helps squash the 20% of the negative that comes through that says, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. Why are you? This is ridiculous. I listen to the 80% because I'm originally from Nevada. I'm a betting girl. 80% wins 80% of the time. <laughs> and I think it is, it's just man, it's managing your thoughts, right? A lot of it is just training yourself, creating that habit. All right. So here is a great question. Is there anything you would do differently in your pivots if you could do them over again? So any lessons learned or mistakes you made? Go ahead, Catrice. I got I to gotta think on this one. Let me think on this. One. All right. Well, I got one. Here's what I would do. I would have done it sooner, first off. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Like, remember, she asked me three times <laughs> to apply, not even take the job, just apply for it. I blew her off twice. I would have done it sooner. I would have taken that leap sooner. Now, of course, hindsight's 2020, and I know that it all worked out, but there was no reason for me to say no, other than I listened to the 20% and not the 80%. I should have done it a, a lot sooner. Take the leap. I agree with Andy. I would echo what Andy says it, um, in, ter- in, in terms of pay attention to the signs in your life, okay? So there are signs, and if you're paying attention, it can make all the difference. So Andy, like there was a sign in your life, took you three times, okay? Similarly, I had a girlfriend who told me way before the, the, the last pivot that was imposed upon me, the one that I didn't choose, but where I lost my job. And she, she told me like, I don't know, 18 months in advance, you know, you really need, can't you see the handwriting on the wall? You really need to leave that job, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 I can make it to blah, 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 blah. Right. Oh, I convinced myself. Okay. But had I listened, right? Had I paid attention to the signs, like you, Andy, I would have done it sooner. I would have saved myself a lot of hard ache and grief. So pay attention to the signs, listen to the people around you who can be more objective than you are because you're too emotionally invested in what you got going on in your life. So trust the people around you. That would be my advice. I'm actually going to share something that Catrice that you told me. Okay. Okay. I'm going to share some of your wisdom, some of your nuggets of wisdom. You said, don't wait to feel like you're hundred percent ready because you won't ever feel like you're hundred percent ready. You said, do it at 20%. <laughs> at least you can say you tried. Exactly. At least you could say you tried. I love that. All right. Let me see. We have another question here. Catrice, your cookies are literally artwork. They are gorgeous. Can you give us an inside scoop on how you got so good at it and where you get your inspiration and creative ideas? So, whew, I think I've literally gotten good over time from just not stopping. I think every order that I do pushes me forward, um, challenges me, um, it just gets me to think of how to get things done and have them look nice and taste nice. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. Um, where do you get your inspiration for your yeah, creative ideas? 
So literally everywhere. I go to Michael's and, you know, walk down the aisles and take pictures of everything. I go, you know, if I'm doing a set for basketball, I might want to go to their game. I might want to see what the players, what jerseys look like. Um, what are they using a Spalding ball? Or are they using whatever other ball? What does this score uh, keeper look like? Uh, who's the ref? You know, I want my cookies to be as personal, as custom as possible. I want for you to see those and know that they are for you and you only. What would you say was that when you got done with the cookie, it was like the most satisfying, this is done and it looks great and I'm really happy with it. I recently did a set where I did a Cheetos bag cookie. <laughs> And when I say, when this cookie came out, this cookie, you, you wouldn't even be able to tell if it was Cheetos or if it was a cookie. It, it turned out amazing, literally amazing. I still, like, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. I was like, oh, I just wanted to keep it for myself. I didn't even want to give it to the lady. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that so much you came up with the idea to ask for a Cheetos bag, right? <laughs> know, right? It was for, for her daughter. She liked ramen. I did ramen. I did a Takis bag and a, a Cheetos bag. It was so awesome. So Elizabeth and Andy, what would you add to that about like, what were the things that you feel like help you keep getting better at what you do and what you're, what you're good at and what's your inspiration? I had to keep my mind open and I continually learn just like you do. We, you're never perfect. And even though, you know, I, I'm pretty good at, at what I'm doing now, there's always the day where I'm like, huh, that's a fantastic idea. And if I'm closed off because someone else came up with it, then we can never grow, right? So I learn all the time from awesome people, from um, industry specialists, where we try and obviously take those ideas and incorporate it into what I do at the Mount. So, I mean, you've always got to keep your eyes open. If you're always closed off saying, I am at the pinnacle of my game, I'm the best there is, I, one, I doubt it. And two, you never are because you can always learn. You can always get better. Um, and I think that's just what really keeps things fresh is having the open mindset to say, that's a badass idea. I'd love to incorporate that. I'll give you credit. How did you come up with that? Um, and, and I think that's what helps us continually grow in our industry. Mm. Yeah, I, I couldn't say it better, Andy. I mean, I completely agree with what you say. And, um, you know, my my mindset has always been, and I tell students this all the time, or, or, or my kids or anybody, always play for the A team. Like, there's no reason to play for the B team or the C team or the D team, mm -hmm. right? Always want to be on the best and be working with and surrounded by the best in their field for what they do because there's no reason to do anything less. And so if you're always looking to the A players and, and, and finding out how do they do what they do, how did they get there? Let me talk to them, let me make a connection. That's what fuels me is I, al I will never, I always wanna be on the A team. And I always wanna work with people who have that same mentality. And so I'll always look to the A players in whatever industry or whatever thing that interests me and um, make a connection and, and, and try and learn a little bit more or achieve that, like you said, Andy. I love that. Yeah, I was just doing a recommendation for someone I used to work with and I thought, why would I recommend this person? I thought, you know what? Because they always made me bring my A game. Like when I knew I was going to work with them, I knew I needed to come prepare because they were going to make me look bad if I did it, right? So surround yourself with the A players. I love that. So what advice would you give your 16 year old self? All right, the, uh, Catrice is gonna love this. My advice to the 16 year old self, are you ready? Is uh, eat the cake and turn left. And that simply means don't limit yourself simply because uh, you have a preconceived notion of what you should be. If you want cake, eat the damn cake. And you don't always have to take the straight line to everything you want to do. Turn left and experience something. Like, you know, get off the beaten path. Learn something completely outside of what you wanted. You don't have to stay in a lane so narrow that you can't ever experience what's outside in the world. Eat the cake, turn left. I think I would just tell my 16-year-old self, you know, just go and experience. I think in life, you are only as good as your experiences. 
And I would say, uh, whatever doubts you have, your 16 year old self, guess what? A lot of other people have this exact same doubts. You are not on an island, you are not alone. Uh, you know, lots of people feel what you feel, think what you think. So grab them arm in arm and face them together. Just gotta, you have to talk, you have to talk to people, communicate, uh, you're not alone. So since we know there's some people out there who are thinking about a pivot or maybe in the midst of a pivot, what do you want them to know? I want them to know that change is why we're, I, in my really humble opinion, that's why we're here. Like if you don't change, you don't evolve. And right, we're here to continue to evolve and learn more and get better. And the only way you do that is by continuing to just push yourself out of your boundaries a little bit. And that's the purpose of being here. I, I remember when I wanted to change, you know, my first pivot when I went from finance to the culinary industry and be a chef. And I remember telling my dad, that's what I wanted to do. And he's and he he just was completely perplexed. He's like, What? You're doing what? And I said, yeah, dad, I want to, I want to leave the finance industry. I want to go be a chef. And he said, why would you want to do I said, because by the time I leave uh, this earth, I want to have done and experienced a lot of different things. And um, to me, that's a, a life well fulfilled. And, you know, talking to someone who, you know, had one singular, uh, prof you know, aspiration and profession was, is very accomplishing. Good with it. Couldn't, couldn't wrap his head around that concept. Like, no, 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 no. I want to do a whole bunch of different things. I don't care if I'm the best at it. You know, it's okay. But I just want to, you know, live my life and go to my grave having just experienced a lot of, a lot of different things. So I don't even remember what your question was. I don't even know. What <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For whatever that's worth. <laughs> I love that. So it's just, what do, you, what do you want someone who's thinking about a pivot or maybe he's in the midst of a pivot? What do, what do you just want them to know? So that was great, Elizabeth. What do you, trust your gut. <laughs> trust your gut. If your gut isn't telling you anything, just continue to move forward. Continue with your action until your gut does say something to you. Yeah, I love that. Do you think that Andy and Elizabeth, did that come into play for you too? Trusting your gut? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It did. But, but also, so, so I think that no matter what decision you make, it is your decision, right? And so you can get all this information from all your support. You can read articles online, you can do your research, but ultimately the decision to pivot or the decision at all to take that action or not take that action is yours. So arm yourself with as much information as you can. And while support systems are great, they don't make the decision you do because you have to live with it and you have to understand that your success is in yours and you will have some help or if it doesn't work out, it is your decision. And I think that at the bottom line, and I don't mean to say that your spouses don't matter or the people that you take care of if you have kids or older parents, but ultimately if they don't pay your bills, then their advice is appreciated, but it doesn't mean they can make the decision for you. It is your decision. So research it, get the information and make it. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think, you know, when you, when you say, Andy, you know, it's yours. Um, that's so true. And for so many people, like, and, and for me, this was true too. To get to that place, you really have to invest in some alone time. You have to invest in some time to just reflect shut it down, shut out all the noise in the world, right? And just for yourself, because, you know, our lives are so busy, right? Constantly going, 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 and you can't have clarity. It's really hard to get clarity and think about what you really want, unless, unless there's some quiet and some peace. And you gotta, you gotta, that has to be intentional. You have to like make that intentional, quiet, peaceful, reflection time for yourself and whether that's going somewhere or shutting you know just giving yourself some time um and it, it feels gratuitous sometimes you know to just do but but it's not it'll pay dividends definitely pay dividends to give yourself that clarity and that peace of mind to make a good decision like you're saying andy like trust your gut it's yeah. your decision 
to make a good decision for yourself, you need clarity. You need you, you uh, of mind, and you need to be in a, in a peaceful space where, where not all that noise. You gotta make time for that for yourself. Need that quiet time to li to listen to your gut, right? And to hear the the nudges and the signs and all of that. I actually printed off um, a, a little sign, a little piece of paper that I have in my home office that says, "Consider this a sign," right? It's just my reminder of. There, I, I'm probably missing all kinds of signs because we all feel like we're in this, we're moving at this fast pace, we're in this busy world and there's some kind of badge of honor with that where we don't get that, that slow down thinking time that we all need. So um, before we start closing out, because you guys believe it, we're almost out of time. Um, I want to give you each an opportunity to, to just share a final thought. So is there anything that you haven't said yet that you'd want to say or anything that you want to reemphasize to our audience? I think um, I just wanted to say again how important it is to have a good circle. I um, feel blessed to be a part of this panel and to have these new people in my circle. And I can't wait to see what the future holds. I see big things, Patrice. Thank you. Is Elizabeth frozen? No, nope, she's not frozen. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Do you want to go or do you want me to go? You go. Okay. Uh, the last thing is find yourself a cheerleader. Seriously. Find someone that can give you the real on the real and say, mm, here's my thoughts, but cheerlead you in every step of the way. You make a decision, I cheerlead you. Even if it's the wrong decision in the end, you made one, you did something. That action is worthy of praise, right? You did something. That's great. Find yourself a cheerleader, one that isn't just going to kind of like blow smoke, but is truly honored by the fact that they know you, they support you, they empower you, and you get empowerment from them. Get yourself a cheerleader, eat the cake and turn left. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you need it. We need a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love that. I, I, I would say, you know, similarly to, to what Andy and countries have said that, um, you know, action will always reap a benefit for you versus inaction. You can continue to do the same thing over and over again, or sit on the couch or do whatever in your same routine. Okay. But unless you take some action towards what you imagine you, you want to do, um, nothing's going to change unless you change, nothing will change. So you have to take some action. And you just, you know, even if the action results in, okay, well, that was a mistake. You learned something from it. You did something. You took action. So um, don't be afraid to just take a step, take action, okay? And eventually you'll get there or you'll, you'll learn a little bit more in the process. So um, yes. inaction will yield nothing, but action will yield something. And I think the inaction can mess with your head, right? Like when you're doing things and you feel like you have choices, it feels like you're getting your power back. And I think, you know, that's what, that's what we all need to move forward. So um, I really want to thank you all for being here tonight. You know, whatever reason, whatever motivated you to be here this evening, we're just so grateful that um, you guys took the time to be here. We hope that you found something to think about, to put to use, to consider, to inspire you. Um, because that's what this was was all about. And I want to thank the wonderful pa panel that we have here, the fabulous women. I hope you guys enjoyed their stories and learned so much from them. So thank you, Andy and Catrice and Elizabeth. It's been such a pleasure um, getting to know you all. And like I said, now, now that I know you, you can't get away from me. So just, just so you know. Um, and I also want to thank the chamber, especially the Women in Business Committee for um, putting this on. And it's, I think it's a fabulous thing for us to be able to get together and as powerful women and, and share our stories and learn from each other. Um, to close out, I just wanted to share one of the common themes that I did hear from the stories of all three of these fabulous women was the whole theme of, you know, even when sometimes it felt like it, it was remembering that you're not alone. Right? There's always people around you that are there to support you. People who won't say no when you make the ask. So remember that you're not alone. And I saw this quote the other day. It says, sometimes you have to borrow someone else's belief in you until yours kicks in. Yes. So whatever it is you're thinking about, whatever it is that you want to do, we just want you to know that we believe in you. 
So thank you all for being here and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks guys. Thanks Debbie. Thanks Andy. Thanks Catrice. Thanks. Oh, thank you guys. Mwah.